The Call of the Bully, Chapter 15. This is called High Heels and Deer Guts. Yep, High Heels and Deer Guts. Crazy title, huh? A couple of days later, I met Allison out in the woods past the archery range. We'd arranged to go over a few details before my change into Rodwina. Stinky came along, too, and sat on a stump, itching himself. What is this stuff? I asked Allison. It's called blush, she answered, rubbing some on the top of my hand. What does it do? Rodney, it makes your cheeks look red, like you're blushing. Boys like that. They do? I mean, we do? Yes, you do. She examined my hand. I guess this color will work. Now, the night of Mrs. Periwinkle's party, you're really going to have to clean your cuticles. Look at them. What's a cuticle? She rolled her eyes and pulled out a, a bottle of perfume. Don't tell me I have to wear that, too, I paused. No, this is for him. She turned and sprayed Stinky a few times. Hey, he whined. She ignored his protests and continued talking to him. This plan of Fernando's has a long way to go. You're the one who volunteered to help me, I reminded her. She continued like she hadn't heard me. Listen, the night of the party, I'll meet you here where no one will see us, and I'll help you get dressed. I still have the wig, and I borrowed some pretty high heels. This whole plan was sounding more and more impossible, and way more embarrassing if I got caught. Nevertheless, I was committed now. Plus, there was something reassuring about Allison. I watched as she arranged everything like she had done this a hundred times before. I liked the way she didn't make a fuss about things. The summer leaves rustled in the afternoon breeze. In the distance, you could hear kids shouting down by the lake. It felt fun to be meeting secretly like this in the woods. Allison had picked the spot, the old stone chimney. It was a chimney <clears throat> left standing in the middle of a small clearing. I guess a cabin had once surrounded the chimney, but it was long gone. Some farmer and his family probably lived here in the olden days, Allison said. I bet he didn't have to wear high heels, I joked. She gave me a big smile and her eyes met. A second later, her cheeks turned bright red. Is that blush you're wearing, I asked. No, Rodney, she sighed, looking down. I realized I really liked her. I was in the middle of admiring her long red hair and tan skin when she glanced up. Her deep brown eyes looked into mine. I gazed into them, starting to feel bleh, stinky exploded. Spell broken, Allison said. Okay, I'm going to be late for windsurfing. Rodney, practice walking on your toes with your hand on your hip. That will help you get ready for the high heels. Uh, all right. Thanks, I guess. Bye, Rodney. Bye, Frank. Bye, Allison, stinky called. I watched her walk down the path toward the lake. She rounded a bend in the trail and was gone. I stood for a second, breathing in the warm, woodsy air. For the first time in a couple of days, my stomach wasn't in a knot over sadness with Jessica. Stinky and I turned and walked off in the other direction. I had athletics with Mr. Cramps, in no rush to do my usual assortment of push-ups, crunches, squat thrusts, and mile run. We took the long cut along a trail that followed a small creek. After a while, I decided to practice walking on my tippy toes. Does it look like I'm walking like a girl? I laughed. Stinky answered, I'm not sure. You do look pretty weird. I tried a few more times. Then I put my hand on my hip like Allison and said, how about now? Get a load of this guy. It wasn't Stinky's voice. I spun around. Now, I've faced some pretty bad situations in my life. So I can't say I was completely surprised to see Todd and his usual pack of Algonquins. They were sitting on a log off the trail. Nice walk, Rathbone, Todd shouted, getting up. The Algonquins laughed and all rose off the log, starting to walk in our direction. Todd was actually wearing white pants and a white shirt. His hair shimmered in the sun. Nice outfit, I said. I'll take a snow cone. He wasn't amused. So this is what losers do for fun? Walk around like girls? Let me try. With that, he began to walk crazily down the path. Look at me. I'm Rodney. Whoopee. The other Algonquins were laughing. Todd kept going. Hula, uh oh. He stopped short and rubbed his forehead. 
That hurt. What was that? He reached down and picked up an acorn. Did you throw this at me, Rathbone? I hadn't thrown anything. Maybe the sky is falling. You're dead. Relax, I said. We didn't do anything. Right, Frank? There was no reply. I glanced over at him. Frank? Stinky shrugged. It seemed like the right thing to do at the time. I couldn't believe it. Here in the middle of the woods, Stinky suddenly decided to act brave. While I understood his logic, I also knew what would come next. Open fire! Todd shouted. Within seconds, acorns whizzed through the air. I felt sharp stings on my shoulder and back. I scrambled behind a tree and looked for ammunition. Stinky was already launching acorns across as fast as he could, and I heard a couple of yelps from the Algonquins. We put up a good fight that day, but as the battle wore on, it was obvious we were outnumbered. My body stung in a dozen places where the acorns hit their marks. Todd threw an enormous acorn that zipped past my head and bounced off the tree with a loud whack. I knew I couldn't stay trapped behind the tree forever. I ran a few feet, jumped over the small bunny creek, and turned and nailed Skip in the neck. As Stinky jumped over to join me, he let out a yell. A rock had left Todd's hand and hit him in the elbow. Stinky grabbed it and grimaced in pain. Todd wasn't playing by the rules. Hey, no rocks, I yelled angrily. Todd laughed. Or else what? Are you going to tell your mommy? The last thing I wanted was a fight. But I was sick of Todd telling, thinking he could bully me. I looked around. Come over here and I'll show you what I'll do. Todd smiled. This ought to be interesting. He took a few steps closer and was just on the other side of the stream when I made my move. Hey, your shoe's untied. Is that all you've got, Rathbone? He laughed, turning to smile at his fellow Algonquins. Yeah, and this. In front of me were some large rocks. With two hands, I grabbed one that weighed about 40 pounds and heaved it into the creek. By the time Todd realized what I was doing, it was too late. My boulder landed and sent up a wall of mud that covered him from head to foot, white pants and all. I locked eyes with Stinky. Run! We spun around and took off, not on the path, but straight into the woods. You're dead! Todd screamed, bounding after me like a madman. Small branches scraped and scratched my face, but I kept running. Stinky got blocked by some thick underbrush and ran off in another direction. Unfortunately, there was no shaking Todd. As he closed in on me, I realized that maybe the mud thing hadn't been such a bright idea. I ran a few more steps, suddenly finding myself on a rock ledge with nowhere to go. I think Todd tried to stop, but it was too late. He smashed into me, and we both flew through the air before dropping hard to the ground. My ankle twisted awkwardly when I landed. I started to stand and balance on one foot, bracing for the punch that was surely coming my way. I could hear the other Algonquins and hopefully Stinky scrambling down the ledge. Todd said, now you're dead. He didn't finish. Something shut him up. I followed his gaze. A deer's head was hanging from a tree. Todd jumped and actually grabbed my shoulder. I followed his gaze. Several rat-like animals were nailed to another tree. We both gulped and looked further into the woods, standing with the sun behind him so that we could see only his dark outline was a large man dressed for a horror movie audition moving closer. I turned, trying to run, but pain shot from my ankle and I stumbled to the ground. Not surprisingly, Todd didn't pause to help me up. He was too busy tearing off at full speed following everyone else. This was really it. Less than an hour ago, I was worried about high heels. Now, I was about to die like some character in a bad horror movie. Yo, Rodney, the guy greeted me. You finally came out to my shack for that arrow shooting lesson. Good timing, too. I just cut out some deer kidneys. I'm frying them up right now for a snack. It was Survival Steve, and I wasn't dead. In fact, he helped me up and almost lifted me over to his shack. He went in and came out, handing me a tin plate. Dig in! To be polite, I gagged down some. 
They were still kind of raw and disgusting. But at that moment, I was so relieved, I would have eaten dog dew. Guess you could use something to drink, he said as I sat on a stool wiping deer blood from my chin. Let's see, I got some Judeo old coffee, some goat pee, some... I'm fine, thanks. The kidneys hit the spot. Yeah, they do, don't they? Now let's go shoot some arrows. I stood to follow him and winced. He looked down at my ankle. Well, now that's something, ain't it? No matter, got just the thing. In no time, he had pulled out some sticks and rawhide rope and was weaving me a splint. He talked while he worked. I was attacked by a moose up in Alaska one spring. Almost broke my legs in two. I fastened myself some leg braces and walked 200 miles to Anchorage. Sounds like a nice vacation, I quipped. The best, he agreed. Now stand up. It was amazing. Somehow the splint thing took almost all the pressure off my ankle. I walked around. I can't believe you figured this thing out just using your survival instincts. Yeah, that and a degree in orthopedics from John Hopkins. I glanced up at him. If you don't understand what that means, a degree in orthopedics from John Hopkins, I suggest you look that up because that gives you a very interesting information about survival state. He continued, hey, are we gonna shoot arrows or what? Steve lived up to his promise. And for the next few hours, we shot arrows at the big old tree stump. He showed me how to hold a bow and how to control my arm's motion. I couldn't believe it, but I was pretty good. I hit the target again and again. After I hit the same small spot 14 times in a row, Steve howled enthusiastically. You're a natural, Rodney. This is a lot of fun, I answered. You bet. But it's dinner time back at camp soon. Your counselor will be wondering where you are. I pictured Wu, head bopping, lost in his own jazz world. I doubted he would miss me. I was having a good time out at the shack. I said, all right, but all right, but not before I shoot this arrow into the birch trunk down there. Way down yonder? Steve asked. Yeah, down yonder. I smiled to myself, realizing I sounded like a hillbilly. That'd be some throw, I doubt. I didn't wait for his reply. I stepped in and let the arrow fly. It sailed straight and sweet and landed with a thunk right where I said it would go. Woo-wee! Come back next week and I'll teach you how to wrestle a bear. All right, let's go. I'll help you back. Oh, here. What's that? I looked down at something wrapped in wax paper. It's another deer kidney. I know how you like them. Mmm, dessert, I said, holding it up. We walked back through the woods. Along the way, Steve pointed out different streams, climbing trees, caves, and even the entrance to an old mine. Where does that go? Well, if you stay to the right in the mine, you'll wind up down by the lake near the boys' cabins. Dangerous place, though. Stay out of it. Eventually, we neared camp. I could see the dining hall through the trees. Yes, you can manage from here, Steve said. I smiled and said thanks and goodbye and walked up the hill to the dining hall. Everyone was lined up waiting to go in, and I thought I heard my name mentioned a few times. Mr. Periwinkle was busy questioning Wu, who was staring off saying, Nothing's gonna bring him back. Seeing me emerge from the woods, my cabin mates let out a shout and came running. Glad you made it, Stinky yelled. Piece of cake, I said, smiling. I didn't know what to do, Stinky continued. I tried to get help, but when I got out of the woods, Magnus told me to be quiet and sent me back to the cabin. Todd and the Algonquins had also walked my way. I thought you were dead, Todd said. I noticed he had changed into clean clothes. Sorry to disappoint you. Oh, here's a souvenir. I kind of tore it out of the guy while we were fighting. I tossed him the now unwrapped deer kidney. He caught it, looked down, and screamed, Wah! I laughed, and then along with my friends, I headed into the dining hall, where over a fine dinner of dry meatloaf, lumpy mashed potatoes, smelly green beans, and a cup of red bug juice, I related my adventures. Chapter 16 is called Rodwina's 
night out. So in case you're wondering how to spell Rodwina, now you know. Allison and Fernando helped me stumble out from the woods where I had climbed into my Rodwina outfit. My, my, Rodney, you look zip it, Fernando. I'll give this crazy plan of yours a shot, but I don't have to like it. Both of their eyes were sparkling, and I could tell they were really enjoying secret, seeing me grumble about being dressed like a girl. Do you think this is going to work, I asked. Fernando and Allison looked at me closer. Fernando said, you'd better stay out of the kitchen. Why? Does this outfit make me look fat? No. The bright lights will give you away. Keep to the shadows. I don't know how long it will take, but someone will probably realize you're not a girl. And if that happens, I'm glad Fernando won't be there to see what Mrs. Periwinkle does to you. I tried to block that frightening thought as I concentrated on the task at hand. My time would be limited. I had to act fast and get out before getting hot. Get in, get out. Remember, the office is down the hall to the right. Fernando continued. If she has your letters, that's where you'll probably find them. I nodded. Fernando had done some preliminary scouting during his punishment luncheon of chilled lobster and chocolate-covered strawberries. All right, good luck, girls, he called with a laugh as he turned and headed off. Allison and I walked up the steep hill leading to the Periwinkle's house. It was a nice night with fireflies flashing everywhere and a million stars overhead. I took a second to sneak a glance at her. At least one of us was looking good tonight. Funny, I hadn't really paid much attention to Allison when I first got to camp, but now. Arriving at the house, she fixed the wig on my head and said, Remember, tonight you're a girl? Act like one. Before I had a chance to run, she knocked. A moment later, the door opened, and I could see Mrs. Periwinkle standing behind the screen. Her eyes lingered on me for a few torturous seconds. Was I caught already? Then she smiled. Oh, Rodwina, so nice to see you. You look very, ah, uh, pretty. What an interesting hairstyle you're wearing. Hello, Allison. That's a very nice dress. This was definitely a different Mrs. Periwinkle than the one who cursed me under her breath every time she saw me. Come in, come in, she continued. The girls are all out back. Just make your way straight through the house. I was feeling nervous as I passed her, so I kept my head down and speed walked my way through the living and dining rooms. Rodney, Allison whispered from over my shoulder. You're stomping around like a soldier. Remember, you're a girl. Oh, yeah, I'll remember. Thanks. I felt like I was going to get caught any minute. Mrs. Periwinkle was right behind us in the hallway. I don't know if it was my nerves or all the bug juice I drank at lunch, but suddenly I had to go to the bathroom real bad. Mrs. Periwinkle, I asked in my highest voice, may I use the restroom? It's just through the kitchen, she replied. The kitchen? I braved the bright lights and crossed to the bathroom door. Once inside, I turned the lock, exhaled, and stood there doing my business. When I finished, I actually felt a little better. Remember, act like a girl, I said to myself in the mirror, and remember to get in and get out. No small talk with anyone. Don't even stay for dinner. I opened the door and walked smack into Mrs. Periwinkle. Oh, excuse me. Careful, Rodwina. She stepped past me and headed into the bathroom. I'll be just a minute. The lock clicked and so did my brain. Get in, get out. I could go to the office right now, find the letters, and be out into the night. I glanced back and forth. Which way? Ah! A howl exploded from behind the closed door. What happened? I heard more grunts, angry snorts, and banging. I had just decided to run for it when the door swung open. Mrs. Periwinkle's dress was wet and twisted, and she looked even crazier than usual. In a loud, clipped breath, she said, Rodwina, why on earth did you put the seat up? Oh, no. I was pretending to be a girl, and I did the one thing no girl would ever do. My mom always yelled at me for that. Well, I, uh, I was momentarily stuck, she howled. I could have drowned, and look what you did to my beautiful evening gown. 
Mrs. Periwinkle adjusted her outfit. The pause allowed my brain to kick into gear. Remembering something my great Aunt Evelyn usually said, I offered, but Mrs. Periwinkle, I didn't use the toilet. I was just powdering my nose. Her sneer lost its ferocity. I tried to look sincere and she softened more. Well, I guess that makes sense. It, it is always smart for a young lady to check herself before entering a social gathering. Well done, Rodwina. But if you didn't put the seat up, her face looked thoughtful and then suddenly furious. Percy! From somewhere above, I heard a startled jump and then silence. Mrs. Periwinkle gazed at the ceiling, her eyes blazing once again. After a minute of huffing, she looked back down and said, I'll deal with him later. Let's go enjoy the night. After our rather eventful trip to the John, we walked outside. Before me, I saw three tables covered with white linen. Fireflies flew between pink and yellow Chinese lanterns suspended from several old oak trees that surrounded the back patio. Soft music played. I had to admit it was very nice. Allison was already sitting at a table under the largest of the oak trees. I headed in her direction, but Mrs. Periwinkle stopped me. Rodwina, I feel positively awful about what just happened. Come sit at my table. But there are no buts about it. I insist you shall be the guest of honor. You know, I was very impressed with you the other night, and I want to talk further. Sounds wonderful, Mrs. Periwinkle, I lied. The last thing I wanted was to be stuck with her. I'd be found out for sure, and any chance of slipping away would be very small. She motioned to the table that had the best view overlooking the camp fields. As I stood there awkwardly, stalling so I didn't have to sit, I realized that the whole plan was dumb. I wanted to get out of there. It was pointless anyway. The chance of finding the letters was slim, and if I ran off before getting caught, nothing bad would happen. No one knew who I really was anyway. I was just turning to leave when I noticed who was seated at Mrs. Periwinkle's table. Tabitha was wearing a light green dress that matched her eyes. They glowed more wonderfully than any of the fireflies or lanterns. I stumbled as I ran to take the seat next to her, banging my knee into the table leg. Get in, get out was suddenly replaced by be cool, act cool. I placed the napkin in my lap and gave her a wink. She made a weird face, and I remembered who I was, or perhaps more appropriately, who I wasn't. Oh, a mosquito flew into my eye, I said, rubbing it. Tabitha seemed to accept this. I looked around at the other girls. I recognized some, but didn't really know them. So far, Allison was the only girl there who knew my real identity. I noticed that she was looking at me from the other table, and she didn't look happy. Was it because I was sitting next to Tabitha? Mrs. Periwinkle stood behind her seat, cleared her throat, and announced, Young ladies, I'm delighted you could all join me tonight for the annual girls' cotillion dinner. She beamed at us. Cotillions are traditionally gatherings where young people learn the manners of polite society. It's important to have a few moments like this. Away from the dining hall, with its often loud and raucous behavior, tonight we can engage in refined conversation, practice proper etiquette, and talk about subjects young ladies find interesting. Boy, was this boring. I wished I was in the dining hall. Also, I have made sure that we have an excellent menu tonight. What's that? It was then that I noticed some waiters in a catering van parked below us in the driveway. Let's hear it for cotillions, I thought. Tonight, we will be partaking of shrimp cocktail, Caesar salad, lobster bisque, and filet mignon. Nothing is too fine or expensive for you, young ladies. After all, 
I'll soon be coming into quite a bit of... She seemed to think better of continuing, but we all knew she was about to say money. I didn't really care. I was too busy drooling and trying to quiet my growling stomach. After weeks of Gertrude and Alice's cooking, McDonald's would have seemed like gourmet dining. My thoughts of making a quick escape faded as I contemplated a mouth-watering steak. Mrs. Periwinkle concluded, I hope you enjoy. She sat down and smiled at the table. All right, girls. I've been really looking forward to tonight. Sometimes one just needs to spend time with the girls. Don't you agree, Rodwina? Oh, I agree, Mrs. Periwinkle. A night away from boys is like an oasis in the desert. I could tell she really liked that one. Her face beamed with warmth. It went cold, however, when there was a loud crash from inside the house. Who's in there? She snapped loudly. Mr. Periwinkle's face slowly rose into view through the kitchen. What are you doing? She growled. I was just making a sandwich. I dropped the mayo. Get back to your room. There was another bang as we heard him scurry away. Mrs. Periwinkle exhaled slowly. Yes, Radowina. An oasis. A waiter placed a tall glass with three large shrimp in front of me. I almost elbowed Tabitha out of excitement. I licked my lips, grabbed a shrimp, dipped it in the cocktail sauce, and opened my mouth to take a bite. So, Rodwina, the other night you made such sense and had such strong convictions. What would you like to talk about tonight? Everyone turned to me expectantly. I lowered the shrimp. Well, I wonder who's going to win the AFC East this fall. I like the Jets, and I can't stand the Patriots, but with their quarter caps. The collection of female faces looked surprised and disgusted. I came close to smacking my forehead. I gathered myself and gave a big laugh. <laughs> Baseball! Can you believe boys waste their time talking about such nonsense? I love to talk about jewelry. That's a nice necklace thing, Mrs. Periwinkle. Their faces relaxed. Mrs. Periwinkle smiled, and I went to bite the shrimp. Rodwina, she continued. I lowered the shrimp. I thought we might want to talk about the many fine young gentlemen about camp. A couple of girls giggled. Okay, I thought about myself. You talk about whatever. I'm going to eat this shrimp. It was halfway to my mouth when Mrs. Periwinkle said my name again. Rodwina, I bet you and young Todd Vanderdick would make a darling couple. What? I shouted, forgetting to disguise my voice. Mrs. Periwinkle seemed to study me a bit closer. Was I caught? I put the shrimp back down and added in a more girl-like voice, Why, whatever gave you that idea? Oh, everyone likes Todd. Isn't that true, Tabitha? Tabitha stirred in her seat and smiled slyly. Mrs. Periwinkle sure seemed to be enjoying herself. I could feel my mouth get tingly, and I said, Tabitha, I thought you liked Rodney Rainbow. Mrs. Periwinkle recoiled. Rodwina! Just hearing that name gives me indigestion. Let's not spoil a lovely evening. Surely Tabitha has more taste than to give that horrible boy any thought. Am I right, Tabitha? Absolutely, Mrs. Periwinkle. I felt a little anger smoldering, but I did my best to hide it and decided to finally eat my shrimp. Just as I reached for one and replaced them with the salad, I almost cried. With a growling stomach, I took a bite and discovered that it was actually good. It had a tasty dressing and big, crunchy croutons. Not everyone agreed with me. Where are the anchovies? We all looked up at Mrs. Periwinkle, who was rooting around in her salad with her fork. I distinctly requested anchovies in the Caesar. I looked down fearfully, 
afraid I might find slimy bits of fish hiding between my lettuce leaves. Unacceptable! Mrs. Periwinkle dropped her napkin on the table and stomped off in a huff after one of the waiters. Tabitha leaned into me and asked, Rodney, who told you that I liked Rod or Rodwina? Who told you that I liked Rodney? I've never even seen you before. I was stuck. But before I could make up an answer, she added, And why are you bringing him up around Mrs. Periwinkle? She can't stand him. Oh, sorry. Anyway, I just assumed you liked him. I didn't know you didn't. Who says I don't? Well, you just did. Tabitha smiled and said in a quiet breath, Don't be silly, Rodwina. I do like Rodney. I think he's a bad boy. He's exciting. I never thought of myself as an exciting bad boy before. Feeling pretty good, I asked. So, you don't like Todd then? No, I like him too. He's got lots of money. Do you know his dad has a yacht? My good feelings died, but I asked, so which are you going to, you know, date? Both, she said, taking a bite of lettuce like it was nothing. Both? What if one of them finds out? Rodwina, they're boys, clueless. There's absolutely no chance either will find out. The odds might be higher than you think, I added. Tabitha laughed and shook her head at me like I was crazy and then shifted her eyes upward to tell me Mrs. Periwinkle had returned. The two of them were making me lose my appetite, and I suddenly focused again on the reason for being here. I had to complete my mission. Excuse me, Mrs. Periwinkle. I need to use the bathroom. Will you know where it is? She responded, followed by, and make sure the seat is down. I pretended to laugh at her little joke and rose from the table. As I passed Allison, I gave her a subtle nod and continued into the house. It was now or never. Get in, get out. And that is the end of the chapter.